Um, so, uh, as Olaf said, it's not my intent in this talk to talk about PDF UA very much, but the fundamental building block of PDF UA that is tagged PDF. Um, just a little bit more background for myself and why I'm talking on this specific topic. Um, almost 14 years ago now, I started my PhD um, at the University of Nottingham. And the first task I was given, uh, this was a document engineering computer science PhD, my first task was to write postscript prologues for TROF output so that we could automatically add logical structure to PDF. And back in 1999, um, there was no such thing as tagged PDF. There was logical structure, but there was nothing beyond that. And so this started off as a pure technical need to put logical structure into PDF. And since then, I've, I've worked with tagged PDF, and uh, I now work for Adobe. And so I'm kind of bringing some of this background and the, the low level of how one achieves tagged PDF. Yeah. So let's go back to the beginning. As we were told yesterday, 20 years ago, PDF was released. And you know, PDF was basically modeled after PostScript. It's it, the, the pages are represented with page content streams that look very much like PostScript, but with a few new operators. Um, some limitations, of course. Um, pages are comprised of glyphs, paths, graphical operators. Basically, you paint some graphics objects onto a canvas, and it displays. And all you really cared about was that final form appearance matched what you wanted it to, to appear on a piece of paper, on a computer screen. Um, and it was aimed at that perfect reproduction across many devices and printers. Um, and appearance was king. I have a little sample on screen of a very small cut down content stream that says hello world, goodbye universe. And as you can see, it's just about putting those, those, those glyphs onto the page. It uses spacing to position them correctly. There are no spaces in the text. There's no you know, understanding of what that is. It's just painting text to the screen. It's a very simple example. PDF was introduced for a reason. There was a reason why PostScript wasn't meeting the needs of um, sort of portability at that point. And some of that was self-containment of documents as well as um, you know, not relying on what was on the target device. Um, part of it was just having this, this perfect reproduction across multiple devices. What you see on one device is, is what you see on another. Um, it was optimized away from PostScript, so it wasn't a full programming language anymore. It was structured, so it has an object structure instead of a, um, the, this, this stream of pages. Um, and it did some things to, to optimize uh, performance. And it was designed in 1993, well actually it was designed before 1993, but it was released in the 1993 market when computers were very slow. And so the world has changed. So over the many years of PDF, it's evolved needs have changed, needs have grown. It's not that what it did originally was bad. In fact, you know, it had a good foundation, but it's been built upon now for many years. Um, and nowadays, the needs for PDF are, are far more. And tag PDF is actually introduced to solve more than just the accessibility side of this thing. Um, there's, there is the accessibility question, and that's certainly a huge need for tag PDF. But simple things like text selection, copy and paste, indexing and searching within documents all of these are facilitated by tagged PDF. Of course, with PDF UA having been released last year, it's become even more relevant. But I just want to talk about tagged PDF today and leave the following talks to, to address how this applies to PDF UA. So I'd like to just go over a few of the fundamental problems with PDF that are addressed by tagged PDF. I'm not going to talk about the solutions yet. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the problems and then how we address those with tagged PDF. So actually, it's funny. Um, even the, the fundamental problem of um, you know, character understanding isn't necessarily obvious in PDF. You know, a content stream can just be a series of, of indexes into a font. So I have a sample on screen where I'm showing A, B, C, C, D, E, D, F, C, G being, being displayed. And actually, it draws hello world. It's perfectly fine in PDF to do this. I've just built a font that's basically a, a, an index of glyphs. And I've chosen those glyphs using some selector. And I've rendered it. And there's no reason to expect that the index I chose corresponds to some table or lookup or something normal. So which character is it? 
Well, in this case, obviously, um, I, I won't read out the mapping, but you can see how the mapping of those, those indexes turns it into Hello World. That's not inherent in PDF. It certainly doesn't have to be. It's a very simple, fundamental problem. Let's talk a little bit more about content ordering and word boundaries. So I think Duff mentioned this yesterday. You do see occasionally strange things where people render consonants followed by vowels. It's a rather artificial example, but there's no reason you can't do this. You could take a more common example, which is uh, gutter hopping. Uh, this was very common um, in the past when printers uh, couldn't print down one column and then go back and reset and print down a second column. If you wanted line alignment, you had to print in order as you went down the page. So the content would never be in order. So you have to do fancy guessing to even figure out what the reading order of this if you're just reading the content stream. Um, how, how does, you know, people have optimized for fonts. So in this case, the heading uses a different font than the, uh, uh, the text. So how do you address that? Um, were spaces even included in the content stream? How do I know where a word ends and the next one starts? Well, this is a bit of an artificial uh, question because the language is full Latin, but you know, in principle, how do I know what language I'm using? All of these are fundamental problems when you're trying to provide accessibility. Also, how do I know what constitutes a paragraph versus a heading? You know, I, I happen to have this paragraph text and a heading, but I know that because I'm a sighted user and I'm doing a lot of interpretation as I read this and I use you know, the physical characteristics of the content to tell me what these things are. But forgetting accessibility, if I'm just copying and pasting this and I want to actually capture some of that semantics, I can't do it just from, from these things. I can try. I can try to infer this information, but it's a guess. And every, every vendor who produces one of these guesses will potentially produce a different guess, or a different answer from that guess. So a little bit more on semantics. I've talked about very simple things, paragraphs and headings, but there's much more to, to documents than those. Just some other really simple examples that aren't as obvious as they would be, and uh, Marco actually talked about these earlier. Um, yeah, what order do I, I render things in? If I'm just doing a simple list, am I doing it a line at a time? Or am I just putting down the bullets on the page followed by the text? You know, how do I know that that's a list? Let's look at a table, for example. You know, we have the cells drawn for the table. Um, there's nothing that links those lines. There's nothing that tells me that this is a table. And the content that appears in it is just happens to float in space in a certain order that I think tells me that it's a table. But yeah, I don't know that um, as a programmer. I can't programmatically determine that in, a, in a, an unambiguous way. Um, also, logical content order at a higher level is hard to determine. Um, the example on the right-hand side of the Guardian newspaper shows a common thing that newspapers do, which is article continuations. You have multiple articles starting on a first page, and they continue onto some other page, and presumably different pages. So how do I know what, which which pieces of this document from which article? How do I trace those across, across pages? There are companies uh, who, who do a very good job of doing this, but it's a challenge and it's something that you have to try to solve and you shouldn't have to. Um, there's, there's plenty of other issues though. I mean, this is a very obvious one, but just in normal documents, you might have uh, the main body text with call outs or sidebars. Um, you know, newspapers will have mid-page spreads that, that, that flow over two pages. There, there's plenty more than just these examples. This is a very common thing we see. Um, and also, sometimes you have to overlay graphics in a certain way to get the visual effect you intend, but the reading order actually doesn't, doesn't correspond. You know, if you're just relying on the order of the content stream in the PDF to determine these things, you're going to go wrong very quickly. Um, and also, what about non-logical content? I mean, uh, this has been discussed a few times, artifacts. Um, if we take this page, it's, it's a very obvious and intuitive one. I haven't chosen something that's very complex to represent this. But you have content, and then you have printer's marks. Uh, you have other content, such as a, as a running image, um, running headers. These aren't real content. Um, they're, they're, they're automatically generated by my, my layout, my pagination system, and they capture these from previous headings and other information. They're, they're, they're not really useful to me. Contextually, semantically, they might be relevant, but 
they're not actual real content. This doesn't have a page number on it, but it does actually have, uh, you know, many other things, lines that are used to segment the page. Those lines aren't semantically meaningful on, in themselves, but they allow me as a reader to infer a certain semantics, i.e. splitting the heading of the document away from the body content. So, if we take a look at some of the, the tables, we, we use layout behind those tables to, to give them their visual appearance. Um, we also have the body text, and we add things like uh, soft hyphens into the content. Um, and these, these aren't really true content in this case. Um, I'm not saying that the solution when I get to it is the same for all of these things, but these are all problems we encounter when processing PDF. Um, Finally, when we look at the example here, we have a, a caption. How do we, um, is, is that really, it, that could be a real caption, and, and that might be real content, or it might not. It might just be something that's captured from, from somewhere else. So how do we represent uh, all this material? So, okay, I've, I've posed a, a series of problems, and it's not an exhaustive list. There's probably more. I was trying to think of these things, and, you know, Occasionally, new things would pop into my head. I think I should, I should tell everyone about these things. So at the end, if anyone has questions about other problems they've encountered, if I don't address something, I do intend to leave enough time to actually talk about some of these things. So OK, well, character identification, that's actually not that complicated. I think most of the engineers in this room who deal with PDF already know how you deal with this. There's, there's, I've described two ways. There's technically a third, but it's, it's very similar. So the first is that you can use predefined encodings for your fonts. If you say that this is a WinAnzi encoding, a Mac Roman encoding, or a, a Mac Expert encoding, you, you already know the glyph positions. And actually, you can use difference as arrays to, to identify areas in your font that actually go off this, this encoding. For more complex fonts, where you've subset them, where you've compressed them into a smaller space, or you, 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 for, for any reason, you can, you can define Unicode C maps, character maps. And these allow you to define uh, a range. OK, I apologize. My uh, <laughs> highlighting has not translated from my Mac to this Mac, uh, or this Windows machine, actually, uh, perfectly. But uh, basically, you can define a range to map to. And so I have an example of a character map on the right-hand side, slightly compacted, and a lot of syntax thrown away. But you, know, you, you choose a range of characters you want to map. You, you map ranges to, to new ranges. So in this case, I map um, the range 0 to 5e to 20 to 70. So basically, I just I use the fact that I've, I'm telling you, this is shifted. I threw away the first 20, well, uh, in, in hexadecimal. And so um, you can also map individual characters. So you can say, this specific character has this mapping. And you'll see in some of these examples I've shown that you're mapping not just to one glyph. For example, it's very common if you have ligatures to have a single glyph representing a ligature, but you're mapping FFI to a single glyph. So when your Unicode map maps back, you have to tell the person that there's actually three characters there if you're going to read this. It's not just a, a single glyph. So that problem was solvable, and actually, it's, it's usually well solved. We don't see that as commonly, but I think Duff pointed out earlier, it's still not completely solved. We still see enough PDFs in the industry that, that do not meet these simple requirements for content extraction. Forget all the other good stuff, accessibility. If you can't get to the content, you, you, you're stopped right there. Um, so after you solve the problem of actually recognizing the characters in PDF, you know, we have to step a, a level higher. How do we recognize the actual content and, and, and word breaks and things like that? So there's a mechanism in PDF called marked content. Marked content was introduced in PDF 1.2 and had absolutely nothing to do with logical structure or tag PDF. It just happened that later we leveraged this mechanism to, to, to build as the building blocks for logical structure and tag PDF. So we want to logically group contents. Um, we want to look at paragraphs, headings, things like that, but we're, we're not identifying what they are at this point. We're just segmenting the content so that we can identify these later. Um, I have an example uh, of this where I've taken that original example of my Hello World Goodbye Universe text with, with explicit uh, movements, and I've done two things. The first thing I've done is I've actually marked it up. Um, I think I have a... No, I will go back. I thought I had a, uh, an animation on that, but I did not. Um, so. 
the, the slightly grayer text, if you can see that, is basically, it identifies, it demarcates the content. And the operators for doing that are the BDC operator and the EMC ends that, that, that demarcated section. Um, I also put in this MCID, and I'll get to why we do that on the next slide, but that's very important. And this is how we identify sequences of content for later use. Um, you'll also notice the second thing I did was I added explicit spacing into this. I put punctuation in for all of the content. So I either have explicit word breaks as spaces or punctuation to terminate every single word. Obviously, if your language is Japanese or, or another language that doesn't, in its written form, have explicit word spacing, if, if characters themselves define words, you, you don't need to do this. But for, for Western languages, usually we use something to determine the end of a word, and you have to represent those in the PDF. Otherwise, you're left with a, an algorithm for guessing at word breaks by looking at shifts and movements and trying to say what constitutes a little bit of kerning versus an actual word break. So I've explicitly done that. You see, I could still bring those pieces of text together a little or do kerning or tweak them. In my case, I didn't bother. But nothing precludes me from still using the operators under the hood to actually make this appear exactly the same as it did before. But I still need to put those spaces in to actually identify the word boundaries. So we've talked about how you recognize the glyphs and then how you start to look at words and content segmentation. So now that we have these building blocks, we can start to think about logical structure and semantics for this. So PDF has a thing called a structure tree. It's, it's linked into the document catalog. Um, I don't actually, I didn't bother writing out the syntax for it. It's a simple dictionary structure. The root identifies some useful things. It, it links pages to content and content back to pages so that you have fast lookup. It's, uh, it, it basically is the root of a tree. If you imagine an XML DOM, think of the, the root as the, as the DOM root and then the DOM falling out under it. So um, we can use this hierarchy to build sections, groupings of content, and then types of content, headings, paragraphs, lists, tables. Um, and on another slide, I, I list all the, uh, all, all the tags that are available in PDF 1.7. I also meant to mention, so I point out those MCIDs on the previous slide. This is where those are used. The MCIDs are used such that logical structure can link into the page content. That's how you go from the standoff structure tree to page content. So those MCIDs have to be unique per page. So every page will probably start with an MCID of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The next page can reset to 0. So, but within a page, you can only have one MCID of a given numerical value. Um, and the, I actually did miss a point, which was within those marked content sequences, the content has to be in order. It cannot be out of order. Otherwise, you're back to the same problem as before, which is that you have to guess at the, at the content order. But logical structure elements can actually link to multiple MCIDs. So if you have the case that was described earlier, for example, the question about um, hundreds of images, it's very easy to bring those all into a single figure tag by using these marked content operators, these, these MCIDs, to, to link to all the pieces of content that constitute a single block and potentially define an order for them. So if it's textual content rather than an image coming together where the order really matters still, it allows you to define the sequence of the content and the order of it. Um, so here's a very, very simple example of a a tagged PDF using logical structure. It's actually a report that uh, I wrote um, on what we wanted to do with tagged PDF for, for ISO a while back. And as you can see on the left-hand side, and this is obviously an Adobe Acrobat, um, it's what I have on my machine, um, you can see a structure tree down the left-hand side, and hopefully you can see that it's highlighting in boxes the, the specific content that represents this document. So it's linking the structure tree to the content on the page. So we've, been, we've, we've identified how we, we recognize characters, how we do word breaks, how we do content ordering, segmentation. Now we've built a logical structure tree. But how do we interchange one of these? You know, how do I give this to you and have it meaningful to you? So the other thing that PDF does is it defines a standard set of structure types, the SST as we, we often refer to them. And these are predefined sets of tags that we can interchange with other people. And so 
We have high-level container types, such as document parts, articles, and sections. And this is one of the things that uh, Olaf mentioned that's been cleaned up in PDF 2.0, but I don't intend to get into this in this conversation, because at the moment, we're living with PDF 1.7, PDF UA part one, and they all have these tags. We have mid-level container types. I've given some examples here. That the list on the right-hand side is exhaustive. The list on the left is obviously not. <laughs> but we have divs for non-structural segments of content, indexes, table of contents. At the block-level types, we have paragraphs, headings, numbered headings. Uh, we have lists and tables. And we have some inline types that actually mark up the content in the page, things like spans, quotes, notes. So the, the simple content, such as paragraphs and headings, I think are reasonably intuitive, and people figure out how to, how to tag those pretty obviously. Um, lists, actually, are strangely enough a little bit more complicated. They, they have this structure. There are some choices to be made when tagging them. Um, lists are comprised of, of basically four um, elements. Uh, there's the list itself, the list container. Underneath that, it has a sequence of list items. The list items can contain an optional label and a list body. And the list body is the actual content of the list. And the label could be the bullets, the numbers, if it's a, a, a dictionary term uh, list. If you've got a dictionary term on the left and a definition on the right, it could be that term. Those are all the, 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 the labels and then the contents on the right-hand side. I actually built a list and, and fully tagged it. And I tried to show this expand. I realize it's probably quite small. But actually, a small list can be reasonably complex. You also have some choices to be made. Are the bullets really content, or are they just an artifact of system production? If they're numbered, you might argue that they're content, because they actually are meaningful to know the order. You might want to come back and say, refer to the fifth element in the list. Um, in fact, when I was numbering a list the other day, um, I didn't use sequential numbering, because I was referring to another longer list. And, and so those numbers really were meaningful. And they persisted across you know, sort of variations of this. Um, and the list body contains all the content. And a list body is, is incredibly flexible. You can have sublists. So the, 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 the example here actually does have a list body. If you see the test that's a text that says lists are comprised of, um, and then underneath that, it actually has another list. Because you'll see in a second when I show you the example that this list is a little bit more complicated. It's actually a list with multiple sublists inside it. Now, when you create these in something like Microsoft Word, it's really trivial to build these. You just start a list, you hit tab a few times, it gives you the numbering. But when you actually get to representing this as a logically structured component, it's, it's actually quite complicated. Um, as you can see, again, in my case, I decided that I would use the labels meaningfully. And so I, I identified all the content that I, all the, 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 the page content that was labels and associated those labels with the body of that text. Tables. So tables are even more complicated than lists. Some might argue that tables and lists are very similar in nature, but the complexity of tables can be quite huge. Um, I have not given you an incredibly complex table here. Um, but basically, you have two types of tables. And you, you, the, these, these concepts intertwine. Um, on the simple level, you have rows, headings, and data cells. You know, so you have a table, and you have a series of rows. Those rows, in turn, contain either heading cells or content, data cells. And that's a very simple table. You know, most of us are very familiar with those. If you want a more complex representation of a table, we actually have things called t-head, t-body, and t-foot. And these represent headers, the body of the table, and footers. And these can be arbitrarily nested and, and, and linked to build really complicated tables. They, in turn, use the TRs, THs, and TDs internally to actually represent the contents of the table. Um, in my case here, I decided to keep it simple and just show a, the, the tagging of a, of, a, of a very simple table. But um, I will show you a more complicated table, but without actually having tagged it uh, or showing the tag tree. It already came pre-tagged. Um, so here's a very simple uh, table that was in my document that I showed earlier, my ISO uh, tagged PDF document. Um, so I've broken down this table. I have three headings, uh, key, type, and value. Actually, I should mention that there was a caption associated with this table. And following the rules of tag PDF, I've actually, I'm able to associate that caption directly in the table by putting it at the very head of the table. And this is 
an allowance within, within tag PDF. Captions within tables can either occur at the very top or the very bottom, but nowhere else. Um, so I have my table one namespace dictionary. Um, I, underneath that, have the three headings, key type value. And then for each, I, I define those, those terms. So a very simple representation of a table, but it takes quite a bit of tagging, actually. Now, we're very fortunate. Tools like Word know enough about tables that they give us a reasonable representation. And so often, tooling will automatically convert these. But the more complex the table, the less true that becomes. I actually took the conference program, not from this conference, but from the one that's going to be in Seattle in August, just to give an example of a slightly more complicated table. Again, this is nowhere near as complicated as tables get, as I'm sure many of you know. But in this case, there's some questions around this. We have two headings, conference program and technical conference, North America 2013. And under that, you could have something that's either you could consider to be just another heading, maybe a level two heading, not part of the table, or you could argue um, a single merge cell across the top of the table that defines the table. And it might actually be in a table row, might be defined as a table heading. Um, and one could argue that this is either one or two tables. I'm not going to try to, to tell you which I think it is, but there's a valid argument, I think, for both sides. This could either be segmented with the top half and the bottom half as two separate tables. You could imagine splitting these over two pages and handing them out for each day as separate entities. Or you could argue that this is one single table defining the conference proceedings. So there's a lot of questions that you have. One of the things I did want to mention was that beyond these, these simple mechanisms, the rows, the headings, the bodies of tables, when you get into really complex tables, you cannot represent them using these mechanisms. And so PDF gives you two other things to do, use for that. One is an explicit scoping operator for table headings, which tells you the exact scope of that heading. It tells you whether it applies to rows or whether it's a, a, a column header. It can be both, <laughs> just to show you how complicated this is. There's also a thing called a headers array, and cells can point back explicitly using IDs to the headers in the table above them. And it, it's an array because um, a cell might have a header followed by, so in this case, you could argue that um, my presentation, well, I'm not on this one, but let's say you take implementing, implementing 3D PDF. It's part of track A, mobile and interactive. Um, it's part of the Wednesday group. You might argue that it's uh, part of the uh, the, the, the conference program, uh, depending on how you've tagged this, it's going to have a series of headings. This table, if you gave the right scopes, it would actually probably get it right without using this mechanism, um, but maybe not. <laughs> and so you have explicit ways to identify the table headings for cells. And this really helps in the terms of accessibility when someone's navigating a complex table and needs to know unambiguously for every cell w w which series of headings uh, that cell belongs to. So, so far we've dealt with the simple case. The content's actually reasonably in order. It's just a matter of segmenting it and identifying it and bringing it all together and giving it some semantic meaning. But that's, that's, that's not really how, how this works. Um, as we already talked about with spreads on newspapers and uh, magazines um, or call-outs and sidebars, Often the content cannot be in reading order. You could not represent it in a way that, that identifies an unambiguous reading order just by using the content streams. So the second use of the logical structure tree, as well as defining a semantics, is to define uh, this, this, this unambiguous reading order. And it does this by, by using those links from the structure tree to the page. If you read, if you read the, article, the, the, the document, in the sequence presented by the structure tree, if you just do a depth first pre-order traversal of the tree, you will basically get the, the reading order of the document. And as you skip between articles, headings, and sections, the a PDF reader uh, and an a accessibility technology software can, can, it, can start reading from any point you choose and then continue reading in order correctly, rather than having to jump around the page. If an article starts on page one and finishes on page three, it can go from page one to page three without having to even look at page two. So this is very, very useful. Um, and it's something that's very common. So just an important thing. One thing to remember, though, is you could produce a really unpleasant PDF where all the content is out of order just for the sake of being out of order and use the logical structure tree to define the real order. The tag PDF 
encourages very strongly that where you can create a, 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 a sensible reading order from page content, you do so. So within a page, if all the content on that page is in a, is in a reasonable order, have it in that order. It really helps with processors that are trying to consume this. It makes it much easier to start reading from a point in the, in the page. So don't go and make uh, cases unnecessarily complex for yourself. But where you do encounter real situations where you could not produce the right order in the page content, the logical structure tree gives you the ability to, to build the correct order. So, um, actually, the PDF Association created um, their, their tagged PDF for this, this conference in the right order. And this is actually a fully tagged table, and, and the whole document is tagged. Uh, I'm glossing over this. I actually changed the tags in this, uh, uh, and I'll get to why I did that a little bit later. But I just wanted to show you an example of how this table is actually... I haven't expanded this specific table, but you can see, if, if you look very closely, that all the content in that table is identified. And almost none of the, uh, the, the, the actual um, presentation of it is tagged, which is very useful. Uh, tables are highly laid out to give visual representations of a structure. But that visual representation is, isn't meaningful in and of itself. It's just a means of giving a reader an interpretation of that content. What's important is that each piece of content is identified and its type and its containership is, is identified. And that's exactly what this document does. Um, I also wanted to point out that this document um, actually does make use of the fact that logical order doesn't have to correspond with, with the order the content comes in. So you may notice on the previous page that the third section from the bottom was selected for this table. And when we move to the second page, to, 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 to the next slide, it's actually one section lower down in that list, but it actually goes back to the previous page. If you all look at your conference proceedings, the front page is, is this one and the back page is the table. Um, the, the PDF associations made good use of the fact that logical structure can give you this, this out of order um, uh, processing. So, content segmentation and identification, logical structures, some level of semantics, uh, a logical reading order. So we've got, got quite a few things in place now. Language. So, um, as Marco said earlier, language is important. And there are three means of identifying language within PDF. If it's a simple document, if I'm writing a business document for Adobe and San Jose, I'm going to write it all in English. Um, and so I can define for the document that its language is in English. And if you to look at the top right example, there's a, a very cut down catalog dictionary there. But you can just specify that the language is, is ENUS in my case. And, um, and that applies to all the content within the document, except <laughs> there are ways to override that. And you can override that at either the structure level or the content level, or both. Um, and so, and again, another slide that's gone a little bit wrong on this uh, <laughs> as it's moved from Mac to Windows, but uh, um, basically, at the structure level, you can say for any block of logical content that its language has changed and specify that change. And so, I actually do now have an example of a structure element dictionary, which defines, a, in this case, a paragraph, a P. And basically, it has some kids which point to the content on the page that it's identifying, and it sets the language to German. For German, for, for both German language and for the country Germany. And you, you have those two identifiers. It could be French for Canada, could be Canadian French, or it could be uh, French French. So there's, there's a lot of uh, control over that in, in the language. If I really want to, I can get down to the exact content level and identify that the content, a specific small block of content, has, has a different language. Um, it doesn't have to be in that order. The content level can be around structure, so you could, you could have a content level that defines, in this case, I think I chose um, Spanish. Um, you could have, basically, structure defining one of those, and then the content being overridden in line, or vice versa. You could have the content defining that there's a new language for the sequence, but when the structure points this one small piece of content in the middle, it changes the language to another one. So by interleaving these, you can identify unambiguously for the entire document any language you want. Um, so um, actually, there, there is a mistake in this slide, and I apologize for that. The example on the right actually closes its uh, span too late. It, it identifies all that content as, as Spanish. Uh, that's, that's a typo on my part. The EMC should be one line higher, 
um, and that would identify basically Hasta la Vista as uh, Spanish, but the, the, uh, as Arnold would say, uh, would have been in English, and I'll, I'll correct that before it gets uh, sent out. Um, so we have um, another thing, which is, I hadn't talked about this too much, but what about images, figures, uh, content that isn't something that you can very easily uh, describe to a, a user just by, you know, you, you can get access to the, the bits of the image, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, and we already talked about this a little bit. There are three mechanisms around uh, identifying content other than using the content stream itself. And those are alt, actual, and e. And so um, alt is alternative text. And it basically provides an alternative description of some object. It can be used anywhere. But a common use case is on a figure or an image where you want to describe that image. Another mechanism is actual text. So the difference between alternative and actual text is actual text is supposed to be an actual representation of the content within something. So let's say I have an image of the PDF Association's logo. So I have uh, or PDF slash A that's appearing on these posters. Um, if that's in image form or it's done in some very highly artistic format that we don't use glyphs for, I just use vector art to do that, I can identify an actual text that would say PDF slash A and that would tell a screen reader that this is a representation of textual content. So th that's, the, that's the difference between alternative and actual text is alternative is a description, actual is an actual representation of the content being described. Uh, e stands for expansion and it's used for abbreviations. So if I have an abbreviation such as PDF, I can use it to expand it to portable document format. So this is very useful when you have a document where, you know, it might be very obvious to me that DR means doctor, but if it's in an address, it might mean drive. It can mean anything. And so you need to explicitly spell out that when you have an abbreviation, it actually means this. Otherwise, you'll get strange cases where uh, drive Matthew Hardy <laughs> does something. And it's, it's, not very, it's not very useful. So that's the mechanism expansion text. And there's two ways to use these things. Once again, you can go to the structure element dictionary. This would not be a valid structure element. You're not supposed to have all three <laughs> in one. Um, but for, for the case of demonstration, I've added all three. And so in exactly the same place that we described the language appearing in the structure element dictionary, you can also define one of these three things. Um, and the keys are actual, alt, and e. Uh, similarly, you can also use the, the mark content mechanism that I showed on the previous page, uh, as well as specifying language. That can also identify for a specific piece of content, whether that's an image, glyphs, whatever it may be, that it has this expansion. Um, at the moment, in PDF UA and Tag PDF, there is no preference stated as to which you use. You choose whichever is appropriate to you. My personal tendency on this is, if the entire piece of content being subsumed within a structure element has this property, describe it in the structure. If, if you're trying to just mark up one specific piece of text or one specific inline item that's within a, a logical grouping, you could use structure but it's going to be syntax heavy, and the spanner mechanism works really well for that. So I won't try to recap all the stuff we've talked about. I've <laughs> my buffer is full. But basically, we talked about artifacts and non-logical content. Um, and I think it's reasonably obvious what those artifacts um, uh, are in some cases, and it's not in others. But rather than tell you about how to, to choose which it is. And we're just going to tell you what the syntax is for doing this, and because uh, it's a much longer, more theological discussion on what constitutes uh, artifacts versus real content. So the basic rules are there are, there are four types of artifact, um, as well as just not identifying the type. Um, the, the defined ones within uh, ISO 32000 part one are pagination, layout, page, and background. Um, and they try to describe the nature of what you're marking. So um, some people use background colors to give meaning. Maybe you have a sidebar and you want to color the background to highlight that it's part of a separate piece of content. That's not semantic. That's, that's providing semantics to the reader, but in and of itself, it's not logical or semantic content. Um, so you would identify it as an artifact and, and give it the type background. But you can also do, um, if it's a, a pagination artifact, like page numbering, uh, a layout artifact where it might be hyphenation, although you can solve that through, through Unicode uh, without actually having a, to mark artifacts. 
Um, and so you have these four choices. Um, content can only be one type of thing. It can only be an artifact or logical. It can never be both. And so I've given three examples here of marking up um, artifacts versus logical structure. And only one of those is legal, valid PDF syntax, the top one. Um, I separate out the two pieces of contents. In this case, I'm trying to represent a form where I have the word name colon, and then after it, an underline to show where I might write it by hand after printing this, the, the, my name. Um, the line's an artifact. It's not meaningful content. It's just a position identifier that tells me where I can put my signature. The name is the semantic piece of content. And so, um, in this case, you could use forms and much more complicated things to do this properly, but I'm, I'm giving a simple example of a printed form here. Um, and so, in this case, I've separated these two pieces of content out. I've ident identified one as logical structure, a paragraph with an MCID of zero, and the other one I've identified as an artifact. Um, there's actually two forms of artifact that I, I've only shown a demo for one of them. In just the same way, I have a dictionary after the P in this example that defines the MCID zero. That's how I would identify the artifact type. So I, instead of using the um, BMC operator that I'm using after artifact, I'd use the BDC operator. The difference between BMC and BDC is a dictionary occurs. Uh, I, clearly, I'm going too <laughs> detailed here, but uh, use the, the PDF reference to tell you the ISO 32000 part one uh, document to, to tell you how to do this properly. But it's pretty straightforward, but you just have to know the syntax. But you cannot mix and match these. They have to be one followed by the other. They cannot be contained. So. I actually said earlier that I changed the uh, PDF Association document, and I, I didn't want to talk about this aspect until I, I got here, which is why I did that. So what happens if you want something richer than our standard structure types? What happens if our SST isn't good enough? And, and the truth is, it's not good enough for most things. It's, it's, it's designed as a, as, a, as a kind of minimum common set of operators or, 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 or semantics that you could interchange. And so because of that, we we, we try very hard to provide a means of um, giving people the ability to use more complex custom tag sets. So you can actually use any tag set you want in PDF. But you have to do one thing with it, which is role map it to the standard structure types. And so basically, you can see here a document role map, which maps some t types I've identified, and then maps them to the standard structure types. I'm running out of time, so I will, I will hurry up through these things. So here's actually the, the tag tree from the actual PDF Association's uh, program for this conference. And it uses lots of custom tags. There is nothing bad about doing this. In fact, it's, it's something that's a, a good thing. It allows uh, the, the, to, uh, an author to use the tag set that they're actually coming from and capture a richer semantics. Uh, and in PDF 2.0, with namespaces, will actually be useful. Uh, for interchange. But in this case, they've produced this nice role map on the right hand side that maps all these custom types to standard structure types. So this is still accessible. It can still be interchanged with anyone. But you can capture your enhanced semantics if you want to and use that within your own workflows or with other companies that, that understand those same workflows. So I have a few more slides, but I don't think I really need to go over them because I think I'm out of time. Um, but you know, remember, what I've gone over today, Tag PDF, is, is the core building block of PDF UA. PDF UA does um, a couple of things. It takes Tag PDF and mandates it. It says, thou shalt use Tag PDF when creating a PDF UA document. And it tells you how to do correct semantics, or tells you that you must use correct semantics, that um, you, you must do, follow certain rules to produce that. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but um, it's fully compatible. It doesn't break tagged PDF in any way. There is nothing special about a PDF UA document that a normal PDF processor uh, couldn't consume. It doesn't add any new syntax. It just manda mandates a stylized usage of tagged PDF to actually allow for better accessibility. And it has content requirement which, uh, requirements that were discussed earlier. So I think I will end on that. Any questions? Thank you, Matthew, for your very interesting presentation.